welcome to Abnormal Presence Touring Talkies. I'm Kamla Ayer. Today, our sartorial safar takes us on a journey to the heart of India, Madhya Pradesh. Maheshwar in Madhya Pradesh is a small town set on the banks of the picturesque River Narmada. Maheshwar was the capital of the Malvas during the Maratha Holkar reign till January 1818 and had an elevated status in terms of royal interests. In the mid 18th century, Indore came under the rule of the Maratha queen Ahilya Bai Holka. She began her rule at the age of 42, which lasted until her passing in 1795. Her preferred seat was Maheshwar, where she settled in 1767. A female ruler at a time when men controlled every aspect of political, economic, and cultural life was in itself rare and awe-inspiring. Ahilyabai's approach to leadership was considered a model of its time, and she ruled with a unique commitment to the local community. It was Ahilyabai who developed Maheshwar's local textile weaving into what today could be called a center of excellence and innovation. Her vision was to cross-fertilize the distinct weaving styles from the various communities of weavers who came from various parts of India to settle in Maheshwar at her behest and to create exquisite textiles to give to the Peshwa kings, visiting dignitaries as well as the royal women. Thus, the Maheshwari sari was conceived as a gift for royalty and even today, when you drape a Maheshwari, you do feel royal. My guest today is very special. She's a friend I have known for well over a decade now. And this episode is as much about her knowledge about the Maheshwari weaves as it is about herself. She is a sassy sarasta like none other, a woman with chutzpa, pizzas, and attitude. I like to describe her in classic Shahrukh Khan style as Gujuka Dimar or Atki Dere. Born into a conservative, highly business-minded Gujarati family, she spent her childhood in Yemen and meandered her way through sciences in college, searching for her calling. Several successful exhibitions in Bombay, combined with an innate sense of fashion and business, led her to Maheshwar and thus began a love affair with handwoven that survives till date. Such was the power of a Gujarati business mind and cosmopolitan style sensibility, partnered with the ethereal traditional textiles, that the journey that started from exhibitions for pocket money led to her own platform for handwoven textiles, the Vaya Weaving Heritage. Vaya came into existence when she partnered with her talented textile maven friends, Gaurav Shah of Hyderabad and Bapaditya Biswas of Calcutta, to open her very first store in Bandra, Mumbai. It's my extreme privilege and honor to welcome Meera Sagar for the show today. Meet Meera Sagar, my sassy sarasta, my expert today. So thank you very much, uh, Meera Ji. And I know you don't like the epithet G, so I'm going to drop that for the rest of the show. Thank you so Me. much for agreeing to be part of this chat show. And I must thank Vidya Balan because she was the one who ref, uh, you know, kept referring Miraji, Miraji. So I said, I must get you on the show. So thank you. Yeah, I, Vidya Balan just, yeah, she's great. She, I, I also have to thank her because I think it was, you know, that little nudge which I got. Otherwise, I'm quite uh, reluctant to be <laughs> on screen. <laughs> yes. So, uh, Miraji, tell us a bit, Mira, rather, uh, tell us a bit about your uh, journey. So, uh, were you from a textile family? What brought you to textiles? Can you just talk us through your early journey? Well, no, I'm not from a textile family at all. Uh, my my father is was a businessman, a jeweler. My okay. brother is a jeweler. My husband's family, they're all also dwellers. So there was no background of textiles and neither did I study textiles. I'm actually uh, a biology graduate. I wanted to become a doctor. And then, of course, after a year I, uh, of science, I gave up saying it's, it's too much of hard work and I can't do that. So my background is not, uh, even in, in education, my background is not textiles. 
but my mother used to wear hand embroidered organdies okay. and hand printed organdies and i'm talking this i'm talking about the 60s and the 70s or she wore chiffons you know that was her style and i didn't know that at that time but all her organdies printed organdies used to come from a very very small village in gujarat which we used to visit regularly it was only much later that i got to know that it was all hand block printed and this little town uh, where my father was born actually the same village had printing was their one of their industries and so when one day when i accompanied my mother and she was buying these sarees you know the person uh, who headed that mill which unfortunately closed down now said that you know nobody in bombay knows about us and why don't you you know why don't you sell some for us or why don't you so my mom says it's not my cup of tea and i said okay i'm going to do it and this is probably uh, late 70s i wasn't married i was just fresh out of probably college and i bought i mean i didn't buy them but i convinced him to give me the sarees and i said i'll sell it and at that time in bombay there was only one gallery called akara art gallery and i did an exhibition there and we in those days we were sold out on day 1 to that extent that the illustrated weekly of india which was a very big magazine at that point wanted to know you know who was doing this and where and i i remember dressing up in a sari at that age and giving this interview and i was super thrilled and that led on to maybe one or two of those kind of exhibitions with hand block printed organdies and that's it there was nothing more that i was doing at that point and then that was the end of my textile journey for that time got married and i went off to kuwait where i lived for a few years before i returned to india when i returned to india in the late 80s a sister in law of mine suggested why don't i go to maheshwar and look at you know the sarees because she thought they were beautiful and not, not many people in bombay knew because they were not being retailed at any of the saree stores so i went to my to maheshwar and i fell in love with the place this the little sleepy little village you know in the late 80s nobody ever ventured there and i bought sarees from there and i came back to bombay and at i sold them in two exhibitions one in juhu and one in, in town and i convinced the weavers who i who i was dealing with at that point to make dupattas which they never used to be they okay. were only for the sarees and i remember so clearly giving them color combinations just from the top of my head because as i explained i'm not a textile designer i don't have a textile background i don't come from a textile family but i just loved playing with colors and they they very reluctantly made a few and so that was my start of maheshwar and i did that two or three times and this was only pocket money to be honest it wasn't ever going to be a career because i had two very little kids i just moved back to india and all that and lived in a very big joint family at that time so it you know running a business was not on top of my mind but yes i think that gujarati business blood runs in me i come from business family i got married into a business family so slowly you know one thing led to another and i started working for an ngo at that time um, and i started giving my two bits on color um yeah i'm today i'm wearing a black but otherwise i'm always dressed in very bright colors and i think i'm known for that everyone you know waits to see what color i'm wearing because i love bright colors and when i went to maheshwar all i could see was grays and very very dark bengali color and light salmon pink and these are not the colors which gujaratis you know wear or your indians your punjabis and so i started giving my you know uh color combinations and saying okay let's do a red and a pink or let's do a pink and a yellow one. and the weavers i remember they looked at me and said what's wrong with you like you know these are not colors people wear i said trust me let's just go with this and i remember the very first exhibition we did on a large scale which was i think in 91 got sold out 
and nobody had seen these bright colors in Maheshwar. So that was the start of my journey. One thing led to another and I fell in love with Maheshwar. I fell in love with the textile. I fell in love with the simplicity. I enjoyed working with the weavers because I'd formed a bond with them. And I, I slowly started putting in my inspirations, as you would say today. Maheshwar was always known for one inch borders, one and a half inch borders. Maximum they would go to is one and a half inch. Traditionally, they were never big, the borders. Maheshwar always, the Maheshwari borders were always known for their geometric designs because the inspiration for the design comes from the fort architecture. I, I don't know if you know, but Maheshwar it traditionally was not a weaving village before, till Ahilya Bai Holkar got you know, some weavers from Surat and Mandu and got them to Maheshwar. Not having a design directory, they didn't know where to get inspiration from. So the inspiration came from the carvings on the fort walls, uh, the carvings in the fort. Yeah. And that's why you see geometric designs. Opposed to Chanderi, which takes its inspiration from the sky and the earth. So even the, the motives are different. You see Chanderi mostly will have flowers, leaves, booties, you know. So these are the two differences, main differences. So I love the geometric patterns of a Maheshwar sari, the design element. I loved playing with the colors. So initially it was always traditional borders, traditional yarns, you use the soft, soft silk and the cotton. And as you start selling, um, and as your clients keep coming back, they want more. They want something different. Any, you, you go to any exhibition and you'll find a client which is come up and say, or kuch dikhao, kuch naya dikhao. You know, that's a traditional thing. So what do you do when, when the, the, uh, Speciality of a Maheshwari sari is simplicity, plain body, maximum there'll be booties, two inch border, one and a half inch border, very simple palla. The play can only be on color or the border or the yarns. So you start playing with that. So one started playing with different yarns, one started playing with prints, one started playing with bigger borders, one started playing with more elements. So I would sit and I would take a border and I would cut up the elements and then paste it onto a page and say, let's, how can we make this border bigger? Hmm. Because you didn't want to dilute the designs. I didn't want to add elephants and peacocks to the designs. I wanted to stay within that framework, but be able to, you know, give something. And since I did not have a technical background in textiles where, you know, I knew exactly how the loom worked. It was very easy. For me, I learned everything from my weavers. I would sit with my weaver or my master, the, you know, the design, the master in charge of the loom and say, this is the end result that I want. Now you tell me how I can achieve it. Whether I want a block of color, whether I want a big border, whether I want a small border, whatever I want, I would just tell them what I wanted as an end result. You tell me how to do it because I don't know the specifics of a loom and I don't know the technical issues that you have in a loom. So if I would say I want a thicker yarn to be used, he said, but it's not possible. Ye to hoi nahi sakta hai. And I'd say, why not? Try it like this, try it like that. So the innovations came because there was no box that I fitted things into, you know. There was no there was no rigid rules in my head by a book which said on a loom, there are that many threads to be fitted and this many yarns to be put and this is the way to weave it. So I think it became very easy for me to be able to tell my weavers that this is what I want. So the innovations came much later as we moved along, you know, along the way. We started playing with tussar, we started playing with silk, we started playing, not that silk was not used in Maheshwar, it was always, but we started playing with different textures of silk, you know, different yarns to make it thinner, to make it thicker, to make it looser so that, you know, when it drapes well, we added tassa, which was never really used in Maheshwar ever. 
Hmm. So we and initially I remember the weavers would just put their hands up in the in the air and say, "Can't do it. It's just impossible because the tassel yarn, you know, is very difficult to to weave in in the sense that they were so much so used to a finer yarn." But we just pursued, we just kept on. And that's why we had a very limited collection earlier in the days when we started with Tassa. We had a very, very small collection. It used to get sold out. And the prices were triple the price of a normal Maheshwari sari. But nobody, nobody cared about the price. Basically, they wanted the end look needed to be different than what 300 or 500 weavers of Maheshwar, Maheshwar were selling. And... The other weavers, apart from the organization that I worked for, the other weavers were all still doing their one-inch border with a off-white, you know, warp and an off-white weft and maybe just printing a little bit or maybe just light colors. We had sort of innovated. We had moved on. So, yeah, it was a fun, uh, I would say it was a great journey. Uh, I still continue to work with Maheshwar. I think my heart is, you know, is in Maheshwar. I love that place. I know you've been to Maheshwar. I've seen your pictures. So you will, you will agree with me on that. But you are seeing it after many, many people have discovered it and visited. I used to go there when nobody knew. It used to take us four hours from Indore to reach Maheshwar by car. There were no phone calls at that time. If there was no telephone line. So if there was an, any emergency at home, somebody had to drive down you know, for us to give me that message. But I used to go once in about two months and I used to love it. I think I just loved, I loved every weaver. I knew every weaver by name. I still do. I mean, if I meet them, I know, you know, who they are. And it was a great journey because I, I knew their kids. I knew who got married and I knew who had a baby and who died and, you know, all that. So it was more like going home every day. You know, you went home once a month or twice a month. So it was great. Yeah. What fun. That sounds like such a great fun journey. So from there, how did, um, how and when did Vaya happen? And what does Vaya actually mean? I've always meant to ask this question. Is there, does the word mean anything? Yes, it means by hand. And oh. yeah, it means, I mean, I was very clear that whatever I did, you know, it always had to be related to, you know, something which we did with our hands. Um, so along this journey of Maheshwar, I was really fortunate to meet two people who shared a dream with me, who shared the passion that I had for handloom. Uh, one is Gaurang Shah and the other is Bapa Aditya and Rumi of Bailu. And I remember we used to bump into each other at, you know, a textile show or something. Of course, I used to meet Gaurang for other reasons because he used to, the first time when I met Gaurang, he used to come to my little office that I had and he used to buy fabrics from me to make blouse pieces. And then one day he said, can you, can you weave the fabric for me for blouses? And I said, who weaves, you know, I mean, he wanted to place a meter, uh, order for about a thousand meters. And I said, thousand meters for blouse fabric? Like, you know, who does that? But when I went to Hyderabad, I saw his store and I realized, okay, that's what he sells, you know, that's what he, and sure enough, he sold off those thousand meters in no time and came back for another, another order. So that was my, uh, st the start of my journey with Gaurang. With Bapa, it was, I remember the first time we met him and when I saw his work, I was just floored. You know, his work was beautiful because he had contemporized uh, handloom in a way that no one ever had. And yet there was a traditional in it. And I remember my daughter was with me and she must have been in her early 20s, I think, at that time. And she bought her first sari from there. And I remember her telling Bapa that, you know what, Bapa, I'm going to wear this for a wedding and I'm going to wear it to the sequined blouse. And, and he said, you know, this is my client. Like, I want to be, I want to design saris for, for her. Like she's, you know, for this age, for her. For, and he, we, we started talking. And when you're passionate about what you do, which is, I'm really passionate about hand weaving, hand loom. He's as passionate. 
we just couldn't stop talking. And, and I remember the first time the three of us met, even Gaurang was there. We just started talking that how, you know, all of us were, had the same passion about handloom, that where handloom should be in the next, you know, so many years. And we, and I, I always felt that the target has to be the, between the 25 and the 35 year olds. And you need to target them to appreciate handloom. Because when they start wearing it at the age of 30 and appreciating it, then they are going to take that forward till for the next 30, 40 years. We at our age have already fallen in love with handloom and taken it to this stage. But you have to pass the baton on to that generation for them to be passionate about it and then take it forward. So for me, it was great that even my daughter, you know, loved handloom and she would not wear anything which was like embroidered or what she calls a Christmas tree. So here, both of us used to be like, and that's how we started talking, Bapa and Gaurang. And, and I realized that we shared a passion, we shared a dream. And I said, you know, guys, you both are not in Bombay. You both are in different cities. I love what both of you do. By that time, Gaurang had started, you know, uh, weaving, getting into the saris as well. So I said, I love what both of you all are doing. And you are not, you do not have a presence in Bombay. So I said, why don't we... Why don't we do something together? So they both jumped at it and said, sure, like no problem, but we don't know Bombay at all. I said, you leave that to me. I will organize everything and I will, you know, get the client base and I will, you know, do, uh, invite the people. I will look at the venue, everything. So they both looked at me and said, are you sure? Like I said, yeah, absolutely. And I booked the Kumara Swami hall, which was a huge space. I, and we decided that when we do that, it wasn't to, for me to make money or for them to make money in the sense, the idea was to be able to present to Bombay different varieties of handloom, contemporary, all under one space, you know. So we started talking over time and then I booked the place and we did it. And we literally just decided to split the expenses three ways so that, you know, there's no profit and they both looked at, and I remember the first day we were sold out like literally Bapa had nothing left Garang as usual by 12 o'clock said I'm packing up and leaving because I have nothing I said you can't leave your mm -hmm. name is on this you know you just can't walk off like that so but he said but I, I don't have anything to sell I said doesn't matter you stay here and I remember the end of at the end of that day both of them turned around and to me and they said you know we were really wondering why you are doing this. Why would you share your client base with us? Why would you, because you're not benefiting directly from this. So I said, because I love handloom and I really feel that Bombay lacks the kind of uh, exposure, not exposure is not the right word, but I think it was difficult to find a contemporary handwoven sari in Bombay unless and until you went through 500 saris. 2006 that we did our first show together yeah and it was such a super hit i think bapa came with some six seven hundred saris and he went back with some 40 saris or something like that so all three of, so what we did is we divided the space really nicely in kumara swami we didn't have stalls and we didn't have because that doesn't sort of you know work for me so we didn't have stalls we just had a free flowing sort of a setup and each one had their own space and everyone was intermingling. And I mean, sometimes, you know, one of us will find a Bailu Sari in our stock and then we'd go back and give it because we all three were distinctly different styles and different price ranges from three different parts of the country. The common thread was handloom. That was such a super success that we decided that we should do this together in other cities. And that's how we started, I think. So we did, we did Calcutta. We did Chennai, we did uh, Bombay, I think we did it twice. And, and I think we did Delhi as well. Yeah, Delhi. And then, and I, and I still continue to work for this NGO that I was working with. I hadn't left that because that was my bread and butter. That was where my livelihood came from. And I remember Bapa and Gaurang both pushing me and saying, you know, you, you are wasting your time. 
what you're doing. You need to get into, you need to do something much bigger and you know, you need to like, and I said, guys, I don't have that kind of money to start a store. They both started, let me start a store. And I said, I don't have that kind of money to start a store. And they both said, we'll support you. We both will support you. And they genuinely meant it. You know, it wasn't just something that they said. They genuinely meant it. And, and I kept thinking, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. But the dream was always there where in Bombay, you could walk into a boutique store, not a, not a sari store, but a boutique kind of space and walk in and buy hand woven saris from different parts, which you could wear to work. You could wear, you could find, find a sari, which you could wear to work, you could wear to a wedding, you could wear to a party, you could wear to any place. As I said, different price ranges, different looks, different aesthetics. Aesthetics were similar in a sense, but a, a Bailu uh, Jamdani is very different from a Jamdani from Gaurang or, and a Kanjivaram is so different and a Maheshwari is so different. So it served the whole purpose of, you know, where a client could walk in and buy a sari starting from 800 rupees going up to, you know, at that point, a lakh and a half, two lakhs. So they said, start looking for a place. And I said, how is it going to work? And then I came up with a business model, which, you know, we thought would work and they both agreed. And I remember once uh, I was traveling abroad somewhere and I landed that early morning and I got a call from my agent. I had actually told him when I was looking at re, uh, you know, re uh, negotiating for my office. I had an office at that time. I said, see if you come across a small store, you know, maybe seven, 800 square feet. And I would like to look at it. And I landed that morning, early morning. And he called me saying, I found a perfect place for you. Do you want to come and see it? And I said, sure. But tomorrow I've just landed. So I went the next day and I saw, and I walked into our Bandra store, which is the Bombay uh, Bandra store. And I fell in love with it. I just fell in love with that store, yeah. that space. Yeah, the space is just so lovely. So I called Gaurang and I called Bhav. And I said, you know, guys, you've been saying now, I don't know, the time has come for you to, you know, literally come down and see the space. They actually both flew down the next morning for one hour. Bapa flew in from Calcutta, literally a three hour flight and turned around and went back the same day. And so did Gaurang do the same thing. They both came. And they saw the space and they said, take it. I said, are you, are you sure? Like, you know, they said, absolutely. We are with you. We are totally in support and just go for it. That was the start of wire. And we just haven't looked back. Oh, nice. And this is which year, Mira? This is 2010. Okay. Yeah. So between 2006 and 2010, we had done a few, you know, exhibitions together where we did really well. And we realized that we were all on the same wavelength. Um, our aesthetics matched in the sense we all knew what we liked and what we didn't like. There was friendship, there was trust, there was understanding, which has taken us, you know, to where we are today, all of us. Very nice. That's, I mean, so many parts of the story I actually didn't know myself. Uh, you know, as to I, I, I thought Vaya was much older than 2010, to be honest. So great to know this story. It's fantastic. Yeah. So coming back to uh, Maheshwari Saris, and I think some of it you already said in your uh, in your initial chat about your journey is the typical construct of a Maheshwari Sari. Uh, you know how it, you know the simplicity of it, the the geometric uh, inspiration from the fort and stuff like that. I have read that the Maheshwari sari initially was, uh, you know, actually cotton by cotton, and then it subsequently moved to silk by cotton. And like you said, yes. that the silk was a fine yarn, and then yes. innovations happened, and tasser and stuff like that uh, came yes. in. Now, uh, are there uh, even within the, uh, uh, you know, the parameters of innovation and um, modernization, if I might say? Are there some things in a Maheshwari sari which are like sacrosanct and you won't kind of play around with like the border has to have a particular motif or something like that? Yeah, for me, the, the border designs are sacrosanct in the sense I will not 
play around with that at all. Uh, I stay with the border elements. So there are many elements in a Maheshwari. If you see a traditional Maheshwari sari, you will see very many, many different elements, which when combined with another sari, you'll see the common thread. So there's a little kangra, which is, you know, like a, it, it's, it's, um, it's like a little triangle with a little dot on top. Now that for me is, it, it signifies like a Maheshwari sari. Though now I don't always use it in my saris. Like I think even what you're wearing doesn't have that. Yeah. But the traditional ones always had to have that. Then it had a little patti, which is like a band uh, of color. Then it either has what we call a chatai, which is just di small diamond, you know, uh, sort of um, triangular, not diamond, sort of squares. And then there are innovations of that. Or there is a, there's a zigzag, hmm. which is called leheria. So these are all traditional elements, which when you mixed it with other parts, so if you put one element with five other elements, it became another border. And then you mix three elements and you put another two, it became a border. So the elements of the border, the main traditional ones, I don't fool around with that, to be honest. I may place them differently than, you know, what we've placed. Like I started at, I remember many, many years ago, I started placing the border in the, a little inside the dupatta rather than like exactly like what you're wearing, you know. So it, there's a band of color and then you have the border which was never not a traditional thing at all. But it just changes it because it makes it more contemporary. When you have that block of color, then that makes it contemporary. The traditional Maheshwari will be the one inch border with the little Kangra, which will have the little Patti, and that's your tradition. But the minute you lift it and put it inside with a band of color, it's contemporary. So these are the small changes that I like to make. But the one thing that I never did was fool around with the border elements. I never created... I never really designed any new borders in the sense of new elements. I don't have the technical background for that, to be honest. But I did, I, I remember once taking Bapa with me to Maheshwar because I was really keen, you know, he, he's so creative. And I said, you have to come, you know, with me and look at the looms because you, you'll understand, you know, the simplicity and everything. And he came and he designed a few borders, which we still continue to weave. And in fact, every Everybody's weaving. I mean, the whole town is weaving it now because that's Maheshwar for you. They take great pride in saying, oh, I have designed design copy and copy. Yeah. And they, they love even, it's happened to me where they've, a weaver will come, open the dupatta and say, this was your design, I have copied it. So mm -hmm. you have to take it as a compliment rather than take it as, you know, uh, as, as you can't, cannot be offended by the fact that, oh, he's taken this design. Yeah, it makes you angry for a minute. But I think over the years, I've learned now to just take it in my stride and say, okay, let's just come up with something else now. You know, yeah. it's much easier. So that's one thing I will not uh, fool around with. And the body of a Maheshwari typically doesn't have any motives at all, right? Was it always intended to be like that? Ahilya Bai Holkar was a young widow. Hmm. When she brought in the weavers to Maheshwar to weave, it was with the sole purpose at that point for them to weave saris for her to gift to the other princely states around her, you know, whether they were in Madhya Pradesh, whether they were Gujarat, wherever. Now she could not, because she was a young widow, there was no, she could not exchange ostentatious gifts. Uh. So she got simple saris woven. And also the loom, the way the loom earlier was set up, it's a, it's the loom technically does not allow you to uh, have any motives in the body. Hmm. So you have to do, if you do the booties, you have to do them by hand, which now they don't want to do it. Now a lot of things in Maheshwar have changed. They do have jacquard borders. A lot of them are doing jacquard pallas as well, which they don't speak Maheshwar to me at all. But then in the same breath, I would say that, you know, someone will say, oh, but your big borders don't spell Maheshwar to me at all. You know, or your different uh, yarn innovations don't spell Maheshwar to me at all. So it's, it's how you look at it. Right. The traditionally never, at the most there were booties. Tra very, tra I mean, really very much in the olden days, I would say what they used to play with were stripes and checks. 
Yes. Maheshwar was known for its checks, the very, very fine checks, because actually the uh, Maheshwar weavers are very, very apt and they, they, can, they can literally weave very tiny checks, which we call one by one. So if you take one thread, which is white, one thread, which is black, and in the weft, that is in the warp. Now in the weft, when you do the same thing, one white, one black, it gives you a check, right? Now, most looms do not have the facility to do one, one thread. Mm -hmm. But Maheshwar has, Maheshwar has sort of, you know, made that their forte. So those very fine checks, which they used to do were a trademark of Maheshwar very early, in the very early days in a traditional Maheshwari. So you did one by one check, you did two by two, you did three by three, you did five by five. So there were many interpretations of that. But that was the extent of design in the body. It's a, it's a very simple process. Uh, most of the, as, as I said, most of the borders are very simple. And if you stay with the traditional elements of the border, there are already punched designs, but what we call a graph, you know, which, sure. which enables the threads to control the design. So that's already set. You have your looms, which are set. Every home in the village has at least one or two looms, three looms, depending on the amount of space they have in because it is it is the main industry agriculture and weaving are the main you know uh, industries of maheshwar so you'll find so all of them are pretty set the looms are quite set they usually a length the length of the walk what we call hmm. is about 50 meters and so and then you which stays constant that color stays constant so if you put a red it stays red for 50 meters so different Weaving centers have different lengths of the wall. And Maheshwar, it's, it's, for saris, it's usually 50 meters. For dupattas, it's about, it's again 50 meters. Now, the, some of the weavers have started insisting that they want 100 meters. Because what happens is that when, one, when the 50 meters gets over, it takes you about maybe two days to tie or rather join the threads the next one so you lose those two days of production mm. and each thread is joined one by one oh. with 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 the with the paste which is locally produced and there are anything from 2500 to 3000 threads along the wall really really fine silk mm. threads along the wall to tie those threads and join the end of the 50 meters to the beginning of the new 50 meters takes that much time. So now, nowadays, the weavers, a lot of the weavers demand that, you know, can you give us for, for 100 meters and not 50 meters, which is a bit of an issue because then you, you are, you know, stuck with that one color. So yeah. for someone like me, that's a, it, it, it's very difficult. So I insist on 50 meters, but a lot of, a lot of them now are insisting on 100. Other than that, no, once the threads are tied, the design is pretty set with the dobby on the dobby borders. Then it depends on the, um, the weaver's skills, how much time he or she can devote and how simple the palla design is or how simple the border is. <coughs> it can take from two days to 15 days for one sari. Simple saris which don't have design motives in the palla uh, and it just has the block of color or just straight lines running that can take about within two days you can finish a sari easily but if you have what we call a palla design where even if you're repeating the design from the border if you're repeating that onto the palla but that takes time because that's a cross border so that's not controlled by the dobby it, they do it by hand so that that can take time but also, they earn much more when they do that. So if the weaver is skilled enough, he or she will demand that, you know, can you give me what we call a palledar? So because they want to add that palla so that they can earn that much more. So even if it takes them six, eight days, it will still give them more money than the, the simple one. So you have different skill levels, you know, from a beginner to a other than that, yeah, if it's a buttidar sari, which is very rare now, they don't uh, do much, then it will take 
maybe a little a day or two longer depending on how many booties like when i when i designed with booties i insist that the booties have to be at like not more than an inch and a half apart because then your saree is filled with the booties normally they want to work with the booty 3 to 5 inches apart so it depends what you want or what you you know who your weaver is and how much you can really push them to give you what you want it's all about it's all about a relationship with your your weaver or your master weaver or whoever is controlling the weavers to get what you want from them normal weavers will not give you booties which are one one and a half inch apart they will just refuse not doing it hmm yeah. i have not seen a sari with a booty at all in maheshwari actually no many of them are doing it i started with i mean you know i started with it many years ago and then gave up <laughs> recently again i started with it and i think we got very few sarees and then the that we were just got up and said i have, i have to go somewhere i don't know where he went <clears throat> the production stopped completely or uh, like the uh, borders you said have got uh, you know the standard uh, specifications for want of a better word the pallas also have something specific that you need to do or not need to do <clears throat> yes they do the traditional pallas there were two kinds of pallas okay. one was called a sada palla which means a plain palla hmm. where what they did was you had you know so if if this is if this is your border the size of your border you just had threads of the same color running yeah. on the palla <clears throat> then you had you know a color or a zari stripe running at every one inch and then you finished it off again with the same thing which is a plain palla which doesn't take long the more complicated palla was when you replicated this design you know on the palla then you gave those little zari lines and then you again closed it with one more so that was a little more complicated and i remember when i when i first asked the weaver <clears throat> i said this design which you are seeing one two inches i want that for 20 inches on the palla hmm and he just looked at me like have you lost it kind of you know and i said can you just try like let's just give it a shot and see and he said it will take me so long and but he did it and when obviously he was paid for that because why would a weaver do something if you're not going to pay him so if he's putting in more effort that effort has to be appreciated and he has to be paid for it now you'll find plenty of weavers who are willing to do that in fact they will come and ask for those designs they'll say give me a design which is 20 30 inches because they know that that pays them you know enough money even if they take longer on to sit on the loom but <clears throat> at the end of the month they've definitely earned more money yeah and i think everyone who works in handloom should be striving for something like that is how to you know innovate and how to contemporize the patterns in a way where the weaver doesn't get bored number one of weaving the same thing and number two also gets to earn much more money than what he had been earning because that is what will keep the hand loom the loom alive and and when you give so today even if you if you sell that sari for <clears throat> way more than what a simple maheshwari palla is you know uh, being woven but if, if that is say x and what you are selling is 4x but you will always have somebody who is willing to pay 4x Yeah. simply because it's just so different from what she has seen you know so yeah so it was it's always been a challenge to uh, innovate but i think <clears throat> in handloom and i think all everyone will tell you the same thing whether it is bappa or gorang anyone will say that it's it's all about convincing the weaver that the changes that he's you know going to the changes that he's going to incorporate are going to go a long way for him and for the for the handloom and for the client and for his pocket and everything how does one differentiate between a maheshwari and a chanderi because 
there is a lot of similarity at the same time there's a lot of difference as well so what is the striking difference besides the geometrical uh, pattern versus you know machanderi has got a lot of work on the body as well is there any other difference in the yarn or anything of that sort the the yarn is the same uh, what is used uh, earlier there was the, the yarns were a lot more finer and that's why you always heard about the mahish uh, the chanderi's tearing you know if you remember there was always because that there's was more organza sort of a feel and it was little stiff as well you know because uh, of the yarns the way they were treated technically there were few differences in the looms which now i think they have removed a few of those technical differences because there was a time when i think the maheshwaris were far more popular than the chanderis it's always a wave you know you go through those few years where the maheshwaris are really popular and then suddenly chanderi sort of comes up with fresh uh, input of design and innovations and colors and motifs and everything so it's always a cycle so now i think the technical differences are few fewer than they ever were but as i said the earlier days the, the main difference was the inspiration chanderis were always very pale colors like light blue light pink light green so as i said it was an inspiration from the earth and the sky you saw these very dirty browns their borders used to be one inch borders like maheshwar but they had these big round flowers in it they had beautiful leaves in it and for some reason the chanderi weavers were very good at doing booties mm. their their strength was booties so it it's it's also just about what one has promoted over the years and chanderi was always promoted with the booties which had silver and gold and most of the booties traditionally in chanderi did have silver and gold so they had a more grander look you know so that's where i'm saying that the inspiration was different completely and that's what it got known for then over the years you start changing it so now today when you look at chanderi huge difference in you know in the chanderi sarees now so yeah now i i now the main difference is what the designer gives them the dyes that are used in uh, maheshwari they are natural or they are mostly chemical dyes now over they they're mostly chemical dyes right now um, very much earlier maybe there were you know natural dyes not any more now again i'm sure that the, you know certain clusters are working with natural dyes but what you call, what you see as a traditional maheshwari at the moment for the last maybe 20 30 years is all all chemical dyes not natural dyes you see the handloom and handmade are still most of the time relegated to almost a niche uh, set of people right and the um, doom and gloom that one hears when one speaks to a lot of people is oh my god the future generation is not really taking it up because they don't see money in this they don't uh, see any future in doing this and you know the hands that make these wonderful handlooms are still impoverished and so on and so forth whereas i see models like yours i spoke to gaurang earlier i see his model i spoke to a couple of other experts earlier i've seen their models i feel that your design immediacy and your intervention has meant that you took weavers along with you so you know um and you know is that the way in which you secure the future of handloom and handmade in india is that your formula for success really i definitely think so because how long can you keep selling a maheshwari with a 1 inch border yeah and i don't expect a 30 year old or a 28 year old or 32 year old 35 year old wanting to wear a boring 1 inch border plain color flat color with nothing really happening so if you don't address that generation with what they want you cannot expect them to appreciate handloom yeah then you will only get your you know 50 year olds and and then you're back again into that whole thing that oh a sari makes you look old a sari makes you look drab 
I mean, I know that it's taken not just Bapa and me or Gaurang, but a lot of the others who have entered this industry who are much younger than me today. And I know it's taken all of them also very long to attract the younger generation to wear their saris. And it's happening. I do see that change. <clears throat> I do see, at least in a city like Bombay, I, Bombay and Delhi, Chennai, all these, I do see a change where, you know, okay, she may not wear a sari every day to work, but definitely once a week or twice a week, she wear a nice cotton sari to work. You know, she's a lawyer or a banker or whatever. Even the media world today, you'll see that they are changing. So if you want to prolong this, the life of handloom, one has to address that generation. So one has to innovate. One has to make sure that you, they notice you. They, you have to come up with, you have to be innovative enough with your colors, with your designs, with your, the structure of the sari, you know, to be able to attract that generation to wear it. And I think we're doing a pretty decent job of it, frankly. I think that the culture in India was definitely, I could see that change, you know, happening because a lot of the younger girls were coming to our store as well to say, okay, one function of my wedding will, I want to wear a hand woven sari. Opposed to 15 years ago when the girls didn't want even one sari, which was hand woven. They wanted with the baubles and the, you know, the trinkets and everything. So I definitely think that that change has already happened. And it, it yes, handloom will always be niche if you ask me. I don't think it's going to be mainstream in that sense. But that's okay. As long as you stay in that niche, as long as there are, is enough younger uh, entrepreneurs who come in and start working in different parts of the country, I think it'll stay alive. There is no reason why we should fail in that era. I do strongly believe that we need to look at Handloom also as a business. Yeah. Because if you don't, if, if you don't uh, make enough money selling it, you're not going to be able to give back to the weaver. There are many ways to give back to the weaver and one of them is by selling his product. And the more you sell, the more he or she earns. So the, the only way to do that is to be an entrepreneur, to be, to take that risk. And I see many, many today in this field who have taken that risk and jumped into handloom because handloom is difficult. Let's be honest. <clears throat> You're working with human beings where when there's a downturn in business, you can't switch off the machine and say, okay, no more production. Yeah. I mean, we have all gone through those times, you know, where <clears throat> maybe sales are low because, you know, all, all, every business has its one or two months, which are a slow, uh, you know, pace for the business. And, but you can't cut back on the production. You've got to be innovative. You've got to say, okay, let me churn something out, which will take a little longer, give the weaver more money. But when it comes off the loom, I'm going to be able to sell this instead of sitting on that much stock. So it's not everyone's cup of tea to get into handloom because as I explained to you, the limitations are that <clears throat> Maheshwar, you have to be 50 meters, which is basically eight saris. I know Bapa has told me that some of his looms run for 300 meters. Gaurang, some of the saris that he does are only 25 meters. Another weaving center has to do 200 meters for it to be viable. So these are all limitations of the loom. They're not limitations of the designer or the person who's getting it done, who's, who's you know, commissioning it. it it's, it's a limitation of the loom. And that's why it's not easy for someone to jump in and say, okay, I will be able to sell 200 saris with the same design, maybe just variations in the color. You can only do that when you have a market ready. And that's why it's really, really difficult for people to jump into retail where handloom is concerned. You don't have enough of a market to sell to, 
you're going to be stuck with stock. And that's one of the things we are facing today because of the pandemic is that, you know, retail has all been at a standstill for the last four months. And I'm sure it's going to affect the weavers because when you can't sell, how much can you produce? But handloom will always be there to, it is always going to be around. It's not, I don't think it's going away. I think it's subculture, it's, it's inborn, it's, but as you said, right, it's niche. Not everybody likes handloom. Not everybody wants to wear handloom. Not everybody has the passion for it. Not everyone even has the flair to carry it off, to be honest. You've got to, you've got to, you've got to like something and you've got to want to wear something. You know, that's when you put that on, that, that confidence comes up and you say, oh, wow, I look good in it. Because you like what you've put on. So that's where it becomes, you know, niche. I hope we can continue selling these niche products. <laughs> I'm sure. So it brings me to the last question and you kind of alluded to it already, which is, um, you know, demonetization first, GST after that, and now this pandemic, which is all uh, so, um, I mean, unplanned is a wrong word, but you know, unfortunate that it has taken so long uh, and you know, and the future is still unknown. What do you see as the future for retail, high-end luxury, et cetera, um, you know, in the imminent future in, the, in what they are calling the new normal? It's a tough uphill climb, if you ask me. At the end of the day, you know, we are all in, in, we're all in retail uh, selling things which we all don't require every day. It's not an essential at all. And it's got nothing to do with the economics, to be very honest, largely not to do with the economics. Yes, of course, economy does affect us, but largely I would say it's also got to do a lot psychologically. No one's in the mood to dress up. No one's in the mood to, you know, wear a sari and put on jewelry and go out. So you don't need anything new. So yes, it's going to be a tough uphill task to bring retail of handloom back to where we were a few months ago. But I guess we just have to do it because when you only done handloom, I don't see myself jumping into power loom or into an industry which does not work by hand. So, and I'm sure everyone feels the same way. When you're passionate about what you do, when you, you know, believe in what you do, is hard to move away from that. So we just have to dig our heels in, work that much harder, and hope that we can, you know, come back to sustaining the handloom industry. I really hope for the best for the future because I'm sure, you know, human beings are quite adaptable to any kind of change. They will quickly adapt and they will move on. And, you know, this is a blip a temporary one and you know i'm sure it will swing back um, and you know long may that uh, you know when you swing back long may that period last and you know may uh, handlooms and handmaids <laughs> grow leaps and bounds yeah, yeah. So. <laughs> thank you so much uh, meera for a wonderful thank session you. thank you so much for having me i'm on this uh, chat and i don't usually do it i know you had to pursue me and I have to thank Vidya Balan also. But yeah, if I would, I would have done it, I'd do it with you and nobody else. <laughs> so. <laughs> thank you so much. That's such a lovely thing to say. Hope you enjoyed the episode today. Do leave your comments, feedback and suggestion on the video right below the video. Continue to stay tuned to our Facebook and Instagram page for updates on our future episodes. Thank you very much.